left major section, which is green infrastructure and buildings. This is the portion of green, green planning that I usually get into. Um, so in this one, there's only one prerequisite, but there are 31 possible points in this category. So the only prerequisite is that some buildings or a building, some buildings um, have are certified green buildings. So that they try to tie this back to their other lead rating system, but it actually doesn't have to be just lead. It could be other third party certifying body lead ra or green rating systems. So encourage design and construction and retrofit of buildings that use green building practices. So it's it's either require that the whole community uh, use green building practices, or that um, a, a certain portion of the buildings use green building practices. It goes into caveats of what percentage and that kind of thing, but I'm not going to cover that. Okay, the second uh, prerequisite is minimum building energy performance. This is making sure that all of the buildings within your new development are energy efficient and that have um, complied with all of the energy efficiency codes. Does Mexico have any energy efficiency codes? Do you have minimum standards for energy efficiency? Yes. So for the United States, the requirement is that we meet this ASH rate 90.1 2007. Um, what's getting ready to happen with ASH rate is it's going to incrementally be more and more stringent relating to global warming. So we're still trying to address that and so we're as a nation trying to have these minimum energy standards. What I have to say is that it's very difficult for municipalities to enforce this. Um, but so LEED is requiring it and LEED has been the most successful um, because it's a requirement. You have to meet this to, to achieve a LEED rating. And the same is for a lead for neighborhood uh, design. You must meet this uh, minimum standard. I would think that for you, like like for California, they have Title 24. For lead projects, they can meet Title 24 because it's more stringent than ASHRAE 90.1. So if you you if Mexico comes up with a standard that's more stringent than this, you could probably meet the I guarantee you could meet the Mexico standard, but you would have to demonstrate that it's more stringent than actually 9.1. Third prerequisite is minimum building water efficiency. So require that all of the building's fixtures um, within the, the water using devices within the building comply with a minimum efficiency. And this baseline for efficiency is uh, the, believe it or not, in the United States it's the Energy Policy Act which related to how much electricity goes into pumping water. So they were th saying, gosh, we're pumping so much water, we're using so much electricity to this, what if we made more efficient plumbing fixtures and that would reduce the amount of water we have to pump? So that's how that got into play. So that's the baseline. And so the baseline, um, there's, there's different standards for how many gallons per minute can come out of a faucet and how many gallons per minute can come out of a shower and how many gallons per flush um, for toilets and, and urinals. So there are these baselines based on the Energy Policy Act. So each building must meet that minimum water efficiency. And right now, um, I, the, this draft version doesn't say it, but I think that it's going to be 20% better than that existing Energy Policy Act baseline. 
So you're going to have to do better than 1.6 gallons per flush toilet. Um, fourth prerequisite, construction activity pollution prevention required. This is for the buildings and street construction that you're getting ready to, to start. You'll need to protect waterways um, from getting any kind of runoff from, from rain. You don't want to silt up streams or natural waterways. You don't want to cause um, any kind of um, contamination um, running off of your site from the construction process. And you don't want to cause any more dust. I've seen uninfected stopped because I couldn't believe it was one construction site the other day I was driving by and all the trees surrounding it were white, coated with dust. Um, those trees aren't going to live um, unless they get rinsed off, you know, with, with rain. So you have to do something to protect the waterways and you have to protect airborne dust for this prerequisite for all construction. Okay, the first opportunity for points is having certified green buildings. So the prerequisite was to say that the buildings should use green building guidelines um, and, and say that they should seek certification. But it didn't require that they get certification, that they just would use the guidelines. This, you can get up to five points for the number of buildings that actually go for certification. So, um, and, and, it, and it also relates to the project size too. So the more projects that grant get their LEED certification or other rebuilding rating, um, the, the more points you get in this one. Um, then building on that prerequisite for energy, building energy efficiency, um, two points. Um, so if you um, have exceeded that minimum um, ASHRAE standard with your energy efficiency and, and increased it, then you can get up to two more points. Um, one way that in case you're new to the energy efficiency world, there's a free online evaluation system called Energy Star that's um, developed by the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. But any building can log on and rate itself that's an existing building. And you can figure out, um, it's called the Energy Star Portfolio. You can figure out how efficient your building is and it makes suggestions on what you can do to make it more efficient. So it's a pretty neat system. It's free. It's a great thing. Oh, I'm sorry, what? Oh, different room. <laughs> I'll answer their questions too. <laughs> okay. Building water efficiency. Um, reduce the impact of natural water resources and reduce burdens on community water supply and wastewater systems. Um, in case some of you aren't, aren't knowledgeable about wastewater and water systems, um, a tremendous amount of electricity goes into um, to pumping fresh water to buildings, to pumping sewage away from buildings, and to pump water through sewage treatment plants. So there's a lot of electricity component here. So if you can do something to reduce the amount of water you use in your buildings, then you're also helping the energy and atmosphere requirements and um, the energy and atmosphere uses in your, in your project. So this is to use 40% less water than baseline buildings. That's going to require aerators for your faucets. It's going to require super high efficiency um, toilets. Um, they're, they're super high efficiency shower heads. Um, it's going to take everything you've got in your arsenal of water savings to be able to get to 40%. That's a pretty high um, amount. It takes some specialty um, plumbing equipment. Another opportunity for water saving is water efficient landscaping. 
Um, so this is where if you go ahead and use your native plants and you use those native plants to restore habitat that you've gotten credit for in the other, other portions of this system, then you're going to help reduce the amount of water needed for your plants, uh, for your landscape. So this is have landscape, but try not to water that landscape with drinking water. So figure out another source of water. Other sources of water can be things like um, collecting rainwater, collecting stormwater, um, collecting gray water. So if you just take the water out of your sinks um, and put those that, that into a, a cistern of some sort, use that on the irrigation so that you're not using drinking water for your landscape, then you can get this credit. Uh, just showing you a variety of different ways. Uh, water from washing machines can go into this. Um, water from, I'm working on a U university project right now where using the water from the, um, the electricity production and the, the chiller, chiller system that's making the, the heating and cooling for the campus. That has um, a lot of um, water that's, that's used for the heating and cooling purposes and then is discharged again. Um, we're cleaning that water up because some of it has chemicals. That's being used um, as reuse water that will be used for landscape. So um, there are a number of ways to capture, capture water and use it on site. Um, I grew up in Istanbul and this is in downtown Istanbul so um, this was a Roman cistern that's underneath the city and they they captured rainwater in downtown in downtown Constantinople for a long time and a number of uh, places have done that for centuries. It's nothing new. It's kind of new. What? Millenniums. Yeah, millenniums and, and yet, you know, for some reason the last two generations we've forgotten about it. So we just need to get back to some of the ways in which we used to know how to survive. Existing building reuse. Um, this is where, I, to me, it goes back to that cultural fabric, trying to um, create a sense of place, um, making sure that you're, um, you're utilizing the existing building stock, maybe making it into something more creative or making it into something more vital than it is right now, but, but not tearing it down and not hauling it off to the landfill. Um, so for um, a certain percentage of the project, you, you would like to keep any or retain any existing structures. Definitely a requirement in this is that if it's a historical structure, you do not demolish it. So definitely try to keep the historical fabric there. It also adds just a lot of charm um, to your project. I just hate uh, in my mind, the worst city in the world is Orlando, Florida. <laughs> it's a horrible city. And what's really particularly bad about Orlando, Florida, is there's, everything is so contrived. There's no sense of whoever lived here before. If everything is a chain hotel or a chain store or a chain, you know, it's like this cookie cutter aspect and there's no sense of community and there's no cohesion in that town. Um, so we're trying to not do that. We're trying to have some character into these places. And so historic reuse, preservation and adaptive reuse. This not only maintains the historical character, the cultural character, but it also doesn't it doesn't waste the resource that went into building the building. So you're not having to create new building materials um, to make these places um, into something new and vital. So encouraging preservation, um, do not demolish historical projects, historical building. Credit seven, minimize site disturbance in design and construction. Preserve existing non-invasive tree canopy, native vegetation, and pervious surfaces. So, um, 
this is one where there's a number of options. Option one, development put footprint on previous and previously developed land. Locate all of the building development footprint in areas that are previously developed and for which 100% of the zone of construction impact is previously developed. So you're not going on somebody else's um, pristine property to do your staging for your construction. A lot of construction sites need some place to store materials and everything. So you're, you're using an existing parking lot or an existing street to do, to do all your staging and you're redeveloping something that's already there. Um, option two, undeveloped portion of project remains undisturbed. So if you have a portion of your project that's vegetation now and has never been built on, you want to protect that from construction and leave it as natural as possible and protect it. Um, for this credit, you're going to need to do a tree survey, find out what trees are existing on your property, so find out all of the species and how, how, um, how mature they are, how big around they are, what caliber they are. Um, you'll also identify, in doing this tree survey, you'll identify any invasive species. You know, there was a really interesting TV show about the origin of plants not too long ago, and they were talking about <coughs> so many of the plants that we have in our um, daily lives originated when one valley in China, and botanists from the eons have been taking these plants and taking them all over the world and hybridizing them and making them into all different sorts of things, and that's where we get a lot of our landscape plants and a lot of those plants have become invasive species. So we're trying to identify anything that was an invasive species or, or doesn't belong there and trying to get back to the plants that are, that are well adapted and provide habitat and are well suited to the, to the climate. Um, there's great emphasis on this concept of champion trees. So if you, if you have a, a very large tree or a very um, outstanding specimen of a tree that you do, you take special precaution to save it. Move around your construction to do some preservation of that tree while you're doing construction. Mm. Credit A, stormwater management. Um, this is where you get up to four points by improving water quality and hydro hydrologic stability promote aquifer recharge, and reduce flooding through emulation of undeveloped natural hydrological conditions. That's a long statement to say nature does it better than we do. Nature is a better engineer, and so nature um, has ways of dealing with flooding itself that we sort of interfered with. At least, boy, in the United States, we really interfered with it. So um, this is trying to um, do a number of different things to promote stormwater management and not letting your development contribute flooding on the neighbor's property. There's a famous um, development in Davis, California <coughs> that was the first property they had to get in. It was this huge fight to get this development in so that they didn't have street curbs, they didn't want curbs because they didn't want to speed up the rainwater running off of the street and they didn't want to have any kind of um, stormwater chambers. What they wanted to do was use berms, little hills and swales to slow the water down for their site. And they did all these studies, are you familiar with Village Homes in Davis, California? Oh, yeah, that's um, yeah, they, I forget her name. Anyway, they did all kinds of studies to show the municipality that they were going to um, keep all of the stormwater onto their property and they would not let any off of the, their site. And it took them years to convince the city council and the, the, the board to allow them to do this. 
They also had another thing where they wanted narrower streets because they didn't want to have these huge, super, super wide streets. And so they had to get the fire trucks to come out and they had to build their street wide enough for a fire truck to drive in and then open both doors. And they didn't want to have it, they, they didn't make it any wider than that. So they're the, the narrowest streets in the city and they also don't have gutters and they don't have um, st sewer, um, storm sewers in this, in this development. This development during a really bad storm, just a few, it was a few years ago that came through, flooded the entire city of Davis, California. And this neighborhood not only didn't get flooded, but it took on the surrounding neighborhood's floodwaters and contained it. And so there, now in the city of Davis, California, you have to emulate their system for any new subdivision, which I think is a pretty cool thing. Um, it's Davis, California, village, village, community, a village, home. It's village something, Davis, California. Village homes, I think it is, Davis, California. Village homes. Exactly. Anyway, it's a really good, good development. Okay, so keeping the water on site, you'll have to do an estimate of how much water is falling on there now and then how much water will fall once you develop it and have no more water falling on your property um, or you get a variety of points depending on how much water you're retaining on your site. So if you were doing some of those other credits where you're reusing rainwater, you're minimizing the water use in the buildings, you're doing the landscape water, using rainwater, you're, you should be decreasing the amount of stormwater you generate too, so these play together. Um, projects that earn at least two points in the previous table earn one additional point for meeting one of the following site characteristics up to a maximum credit, total of four points. So this is this is one of the places where you're getting extra points by developing a brown field or you've developed on a previously developed spot or something. So you're compounding your points, which I think is pretty neat. This is a, a stormwater management plan. Um, this was a project that was all grass and had a high mowing budget. And this landscape architect said, um, if you will just give me your mowing budget for a year, I'll make sure that you don't have any stormwater leaving this site because they were having a lot of water sheet off of their property onto these, these streets nearby. And so a guy went in and he revegetated this site with um, native species. And it not only slowed the water down, but it allowed the water to um, go directly into the soil quicker. And um, they didn't have any flooding after that, and they had a reduced mowing budget, which was a win-win situation. <coughs> Credit nine, heat island reduction. Um, try not to have asphalt paving, and try not to have a whole lot of paving. Um, so reduce heat islands to minimize impact on microclimate, human, and wildlife habitat. Um, I think we've all been able to walk across a hot, hot asphalt parking lot and know how you feel as compared to walking across some grass. Um, so we're trying to reduce the amount of heat that's incurred from our development by having anything that's paved be cool surfaces. Some of that is by not exactly paving, but using some other mechanism like this system. This system in the picture here is called um, um, uh, grass cave, but I can't remember the name of the company that makes grass cave, but this is a system where you can actually land airplanes on this stuff um, and drive fire trucks across this stuff, but the surface looks like grass. Um, and so it's durable, you can have, have cars and can be used as a parking lot. So this will allow you to use any number of combination of strategies to reduce the heat island, have, have reduced um, amount of pavement, have pavement with a solar reflectance index of at least 29. That means it's not asphalt, basically. That means it's concrete or something cooler. Um, have an open grid paving system. Uh, provide 
the shade canopy. So if you're shading the sidewalk, you might as well shade everything. The shaded sidewalk will contribute to this credit as well. <coughs> um, high reflectance of vegetative roofs go in with this too. So if you have either a white reflective roof or a roof that has vegetation on it so that it's not a, basically not a black tar roof, so that that's a really, really hot roof. Um, you're trying to keep the roof cool. Um, so there's a variety of different ways of keeping roofs cool. Keeping the roof cool not only affects the ambient air temperature, but it dramatically reduces the cooling needs within the building. So the building occupants are, are more comfortable more in the year. Credit 10 solar orientation. Um, this is another challenge for, for a developer <coughs> to figure out how to orient all of the buildings so that they minimize the electricity needed to, or, or mechanical means to heat and cool the buildings so that they optimize the passive solar concept within the building. So orienting the streets and the building lots um, so that they can maximize passive solar design. I think that would be a really fun project to try mm -hmm. to lay it out so that you can get maximum um, angles from the sun. Also, another friend of mine is use this to make sure he has shading, um, the sh street shading as well, proper street shading. Um, this is the same. Um, this is the same thing. Just passive solar design, another strategy, another way to achieve that. Credit 11, on-site renewable energy sources. This is encourage on-site renewable energy production for use in your project. So this is making either solar power, actually this is a project, sort of an artist's rendition of a, of a project I think I'm gonna have time to show you here in a minute, um, of on-site solar collectors that go back into the um, power grid for this particular development. So you can get up to three points for providing your on-source renewable, on-site renewable energy. Um, solar panels is not the only way. There are a number of new uh, wind turbines that could, could use this. If you have enough property, some, some big wind turbines might be able to work well, and I, I understand that there's some incredibly good wind corridors outside of Mexico City that, that would be great for, for on-site wind generation. Um, but you can do, if you have, if you have a, a high mountain stream coming down, you can do small um, um, micro hydroelectric generation that would um, contribute to this. There's a number of things. And then if you do these, these can also help reinforce the lead rating for your buildings if you choose to do that too. So you can double dip. Is there any list of non-applicable resources that you're not supposed to use? Like there is one, you know, with the infrastructure system? You know, like it's harm or... Uh, I don't remember the name of the resource. Well, for the, for, so the caveat in both systems is that it needs to be making electricity or power. And so a heat pump isn't making electricity, it's making, um, it's making comfort. Okay. Uh, so they will have it, that will read the same as lead and seed list. That the one for lead for new neighborhood des design will read the same as lead for new construction. Okay, district heating and cooling. This is another energy efficiency method um, in that not every building needs to have its own heating and cooling mechanism. You could share them. So 
this works really well in a very compact community. Doesn't work so well if your buildings are really far apart. So there's a density factor that needs to be determined to figure out if this is going to be used. But this is starting to be used in, in municipal, downtown urban areas more and more. So district heating and cooling would be um, one central heating and cooling plant, so one central chiller, um, one chilled water um, system that would be accessible by all of the buildings. So basically you send the comfort to the buildings and your energy generation takes place in one place. And you can get some really good efficiencies in this, using this sort of system more than having your building generated on the left, by left. More than having your building generate its own heating and cooling. Infrastructure energy efficiency. This is reduced environmental impacts from energy used for operating public infrastructure. So this is your, the, the only thing when I read this I was thinking of street lights, but it's um, water and wastewater pumps, um, any other sort of municipal infrastructure energy use uh, that you do some sort of energy efficiency alternative for. So in this case it's something like LED lamps for any of the um, light, um, traffic lights, or having low energy use um, street lights. There are a number of different things on the market now that are really dropping the energy use to provide good lighting. And there's a number of really good options for pumps. Wastewater management, up to two points. This is going back to the um, issue of the amount of energy it takes and the amount of chemicals it takes to clean up sewage. And so we're trying to reduce the amount of wastewater that leaves your site and goes to a sewage treatment plant. You can do that by any number of ways. Efficient plumbing fixtures help. Um, or um, treating the water on the sewage on site, and this is where the living machine comes into play. Or even I've also seen constructed wetlands that can treat sewage too. Um, I thought there was one more credit here. Um, you can also have on-site treatment through a means like a sand filter system. There are a number of different ways to treat your sewage <coughs> on-site, which is more efficient with the water. You use less water this way, and then the water that you've used can be cleaned up and used again on-site. So another method is using gray water to flush toilets or using some other water other than potable water to flush toilets. So two possible points for doing something to treat water on site and not pump it across town. Recycled content in infrastructure. Use recycled and reclaimed materials to reduce the adverse, adverse environmental impacts of extracting and processing virgin <coughs> materials. So this is where you would look to things like for any concrete paving, you would substitute fly ash, from, which is the pollution from a coal burning power plant that goes into a concrete mix. Um, or use all kinds of other recycled content, um, benches or um, parking lot um, tire stops or there's all kinds of recycled plastic, stormwater management, piping systems, and chambers, and all kinds of stuff. So this is have high recycle content. Credit 16, solid waste management infrastructure. This is a fun one where you're trying to reduce the amount of garbage that leaves your, your project. So you're promoting the proper disposal of hazardous wastes so that you're not contributing to contamination in the landfill um, or anywhere else. And then that you've met at least four of the following five requirements. 
So you either include recycling and reuse stations throughout your project and you collect the, the recycling. <coughs> include at least one drop-off point as part of the project available to all project occupants. Um, so have, oh, or household potentially hazardous waste sites or locate project in a local government jurisdiction that provides services for collecting these materials. So either have recycled content um, uh, drop-off places or you have somebody that comes by and picks up the recycled content. Um, you have litter receptacles that are sort of, that are divided up into the types of refuse. So I think at your airport here I see one, this is Organica, so it's the regular organic garbage, and one that says plastic bottles, and one that says other, other kinds of garbage. So it's that kind of sorted um, waste. Recycle and salvage at least 50% of non-hazardous construction debris. So that's usually very easy to do. You don't need to send all your construction debris to landfills. There's all kinds of other uses for a lot of the construction waste. One of those um, options was uh, provide composting on site. So have an on site compost system. Either this could be in someone's backyard, a really small thing, or a good operation with one of these. Have a recycling center or a collection area nearby and make it convenient for people. You are. Uh, what do you propose to do that in the whole community, not in each house? You, um, so the whole community would have a place like this warehouse for um, for the recycling refuse, where people could take it, or you have someone drive around and pick it up. For things like compost, that could be either a centralized system or it can be in different people's backyards, depending on... Um, so in order to get the lead points, you have to, to show a plan or something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, and you have to do at least four different things for, for this. There's a number of different options. But yeah, so you would show on plan where your recycling center was. Or you would have a written plan about how someone's coming. Yeah, yeah. Either, either thing would work. Okay, light pollution reduction. Um, this is trying to prevent light trespass or light going out to your neighbors property and, and having them um, not appreciate it. Yeah. Um, reducing the sky glow, because uh, lots of people can't see the stars anymore when you're in a downtown area. Um, and this affects wildlife as well, um, birds and migrating populations. So have lights where you need them, like in this photograph that's just a baller that the light goes down, it goes on to the parking lot where it's needed and it doesn't go up into the sky. <coughs> um, so there are, uh, it requires automatic controls to shut off light fixtures if they're going to be like parking lot lighting or something. They don't want it to be lit all night long. So only during the hours of activity. I think there was some. Let me think if there's something else. Um, you don't want your lighting from your development to shine on your, the neighborhood. That's one of the main um, criteria here. Anything like street lighting would be very limited to none. Um, you would add either street lighting at intersections or street lighting in the area where it's needed, but you wouldn't have a street light every 20 feet or so. Um, that just doesn't seem necessary anymore. 
We just have them um, where needed for safety and um, access. So that's the um, green infrastructure section. The last category is offering you three points for anything that we didn't already cover. So if your um, if your project is thinking of something that you think is going to benefit the community and particularly the ecology of the community um, in some way, then you can get up to three points for this one. Um, so. I'll, sh I'll show you how that works. Um, you can either write your own requirements for something completely um, new, or you can earn exemplary performance. And I think that they'll only do one exemplary performance for this. Mm -hmm. Oh, no more than three exemplary performance credits are awarded in this. Um, one of these innovation credits is, is attributed to having a lead accredited professional on your design team. And so that leaves you with four other opportunities for, for giving credits, for doing something unique. And I don't have really any other suggestions. Usually I have a list of things that you can do as innovations, but I don't know. Um, Oh, I do have one because I'm getting ready to show you one of my projects and um, what we've done on that is a whole neighborhood um, water reclamation system that will then be fed into the rest of the city for use by other, pro other cities. So it's part of that water reclamation that's going to University of Texas. Um, there are four regional priority credits, and this is not determined yet what those four credits are, but what this will be is re-emphasis of, like, say, say you have just an inordinate amount of brown fields in your city. You might want to pick brownfield redevelopment to get an extra emphasis, and so they would get an extra point um, called a regional priority credit by just going ahead and getting your brownfield point, they'll also get a regional credit. But these are up to different regions to determine, and you, as a um, your country, is a chapter uh, uh, is its own um, World Rebuilding Council member. And so it will be up to you as a country to come up with your regional priority credits. Um, as I said at the beginning, a whole lot of different people put a lot of work into creating this rating system. And for more help in planning uh, projects, I would really suggest that you look at smartgrowth.org because they have lots of the sample covenants and uh, policies on there that you can just borrow. Um, they have, as, as I say, lots of guides for threat planning and sample ordinances and that kind of thing, which can be very handy. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then the EPA, I, I just discovered this website, Green Infrastructure and Technology. Um, it is a fabulous website. It's got all kinds of different tips on stormwater management and street layout design and exterior lighting and all kinds of stuff. So it's a, it's a really great resource. It also has samples from other cities and what other cities have done. Shall we accept them? for green infrastructure. Yeah, that's it. That's it. 
And um, when we were vacating that property, the city, I, I worked at the city at that time, and we were trying to figure out a way to develop it ourselves as a city, and we all thought we could do it. <laughs> and we realized um, shortly, actually it took about three years to come to the realization, that we needed to put out a proposal to a developer to do this on our behalf. And this developer called Cattell um, took this project on. They got a couple of key players. One is the um, a new children's hospital, which is a very large, it's, it's really a huge um, facility. And um, got a couple of uh, other tenants, these, set, these uh, um, shopping centers, and some commitments from some other people, and they decided to get together and start working on redeveloping all this pavement. And so this is what it looked like originally. It's a large area um, that I guess I'm looking at. This area over here is the Interstate Highway, and you can see this is downtown city of Austin. Um, this actually is a pretty old picture. It's quite a bit more developed, and the downtown is quite a bit bigger now, too. But that's the major interstate highway going through, so it's adjacent to the interstate highway, and within a, a few miles of the downtown um, city. There were actually three airports there, um, the public airport and two pri cargo airport and a private airport. All of them moved away. And so the first, um, so this has been done in, um, I think it's going to be four phases now. The first thing to, to start was that they auctioned off a number of property, well they, they held a number of different design charrettes and these design iterations. I attended meetings for three years and we didn't get very far in, you know, laying out streets and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, it really took getting the developer involved to actually make this start happening. And they laid out the neighborhoods and had the um, core um, tenants. One of the core tenants is the hospital. Another is the shopping center, and they had them commit to where their spaces were going to be, and then they laid out how the infrastructure was going to work. Um, this all had to make sense for both the city of Austin as well as for a new, develop, new developer to come in and make a living on this. Um, we wanted to um, create economic development, and um, this area, East Austin, is the um, the area of town where um, historically it's been um, a poorer section and has had less um, infrastructure and support in the past. So this one, this was it was necessary to make this into a real amenity and focal point for um, this part of the city. They wanted it to be compatible with neighborhoods. The reason why they moved the airport was because it, these neighborhoods were there and. Um, they wanted the neighborhoods to, to be um, good neighborhoods again. Diversity was important, so not only diversity of types of buildings, but diversity of, of economies was important. And there was an overwhelming um, desire for sustainability, so this had to be a green community well before the concept of made for neighborhood design. So, um, back in 1997, we started these focus groups with all the, the surrounding communities um, to try to figure out what to, what to do. I mean, at first we were thinking of all kinds of different uses other than a neighborhood. Um, then, um, finally, we vacated the entire site. So, the, the planning started before the site was vacated. Um, the, so you know, it took from 1997 to 2002 before the developer came on, on the site. We had a lot of city planners involved in this in the, in the beginning. 
So it wasn't like it was being done in a, um, in a vacuum. The Seton Children's Medical Center was the first project to actually get built and completed. And so they built a very large um, hospital and all of the streets to access to the hospital were built. And the district heating and cooling system was built at that time by the city. So the city owns the district heating and cooling system. That it took until 2004 for the master development agreement to be struck. So this was how the developer was going to develop it, who was going to own which properties, um, and then who was going to be responsible for what. Um, I know, I'm not exactly sure how it all played out as far as who owns what. I know the residences all own their own residences. Um, the um, Dell Children's Medical Center, I know, is on a 100-year lease from the city, so the city still owns their property. It wasn't until 2007 that residents started moving into homes, and the home areas were auctioned off to green builders. So the builders had to um, purchase the lots from the city and promise to build, at that time, green building rating um, houses. And there was another section that had apartments and condominiums, and they also had to have green building program ratings. Now everybody has to have green ratings as well. So this was 711 acres. It was a brownfield because of the contamination from the, the airport. Um, it's breaking out to um, 4.2 million square feet for um, commercial use and um, approximately um, uh, 10,000 new people that will be living there. 25% of the homes are affordable homes, um, so that was a requirement to have this too. Um, there was also a requirement for open space. Most of the neighborhoods in this section of the city don't, didn't have many parks or open land, and so there was a wonderful trail system that was designed and um, some parks and recreation facilities. There's a picture, I can't remember if we have one of the old wooden airport hangers, which was a curved structure, became the shell for music performances. So they utilized a lot of the um, existing materials. Um, so there are walkways throughout, and they don't have the plan, or they don't have the buses yet, but there's supposed to be a small bus system because it's quite a walk from some of the residential areas over to the commercial area. So they'll have a little bus route connection. And pretty soon there's going to be mass transportation line coming down I-35 in that section, and there are currently buses that run through this neighborhood too. So the green space is already developed. Um, pretty quickly. They have not built out all of the streets yet, but the streets have all been planned for walkability. The streets all have been planned to have safe bicycles um, and um, to have uh, large spaces for, for groups to walk in. The neighborhoods I'm a little disappointed in the way in which the neighborhoods got planned. Um, they kind of stuck all of the apartment buildings in one section and the single family homes in another section. And, I mean, they did a fairly good use in the single family homes of having larger homes and smaller homes um, in patterns. But um, so they and they do have uh, carriage house units, which means a, like a smaller unit in the in the backyards or the alleyways of the larger houses, trying to build in that diverse um, economic structure. Um, there are a variety of employment centers, um, and this is very close to a number of employment areas. It's very close to University of Texas, um, so there will be a, 
um, just one stop on the metro when it comes when it actually gets um, open. It's been planned for a long time, but it's not actually running yet. Um, their University of Texas itself is building a medical school on this property, so we'll need that. And they're also expanding a large research center, so they'll need that in this in this development. And then there are um, a few office buildings and a big retail area. Yeah. But the population is going to be having this project. Is there a number, uh, a projection of the number, or is it just a group of They have projections of the square feet, so they'll, they'll know the density, but um, yeah, they know the, the, they were expecting at least 10,000 people, residents. Um, but then a number of these other um, entities, like the hospital, have a tremendous amount of population in them during the, during the work days and such. There was already remarkably a fire station that was already, well, it was part of the um, airport, and so they just made it into a municipal fire station, included that. Um, they did brownfield remediation and restoration. They have done a number of different things to encourage bike riding and walking to decrease the automobile independence. Um, dependence. They've increased the density then um, for comparable neighborhoods being built in Austin, it's much more dense. Um, they require green buildings on every building. It's not just all the homes have to be raided and all the buildings have to be raided. All of the retail stores have to be raided as well. So on the retailer doing lead, um, Dell Children's Hospital just got lead platinum. So it's already um, setting the way for a really high bar for the rest of the project. There is um, a massive stormwater management system where they have done a constructed wetland. They have done some lakes they built into. They actually, I mean, through all of our drought, they actually still didn't have some water in it, which was kind of shocking. Um, they're doing this huge reclaimed water system. So it'll be reclaimed water from the, um, the new buildings that are going to be built, the, these research facilities from the University of Texas and from the hospital. All of that reclaimed water and gray water is going to be separated and shipped to various parts of the city so that it's, um, it's a high level of water that can be reused. So it's been filtered and cleaned up to a certain degree so that they can use it. Oh, and so there's a central heating and cooling plant that I think I have some slides on. So this is the transit-oriented, compact, walkable, mixed-use community. Um, there will be a commuter rail coming. Um, it's very close to UT, and there is going to be this rail that goes out to our airport. Um, I cover all of these things. They really are trying to emphasize diverse demographic. They have already planted a tremendous amount of trees. Um, so their goal right now is 15,000 trees, um, but they're hoping for more than that. Um, so the, the, all of the buildings um, are now required to have to at least achieve LEED certified rating and, um, and or the city of Austin has its own green building rating system so they have to at least get two stars on the city of Austin green building rating system. All single family residences must be at least a three star um, green building rating that's equal to a, a lead gold rating. And as I said, this, this project up in the upper right hand corner is the Dell Children's Hospital and it's um, platinum. It's the first hospital to achieve platinum. platinum. Um, the first green, what well, Austin, well, I don't think I 
need to talk to you about this. This is a, about the green building program the Austin. We were trying to reduce the amount of power plants that we um, needed to build for the city. And we decided to expand that so to be an overarching um, ecological statement um, and created the first green building rating systems in the United States. Um, as of last year, um, all of the um, shopping center, which is called Miller Central, um, had either four-star ratings or lead gold ratings. Um, CTECC is a it's a government building. It's better just to explain. It has a, a lead silver rating. Um, so we're already on the way to actually getting everything up and rated. So all projects at a minimum achieve at least a 15% energy efficiency. They have 15% water use reduction indoors and 50% construction waste diversion. All of the projects use cool roofs. These are requirements for the covenants for the projects. Um, low emitting paints and coatings and native landscaping. So with LEED, that's an option for the covenants for this development was a requirement. Um, again, they all save water and energy. This is looking at the, the Platinum Hospital. So there'll be a medical research and a research section and this um, retail area in, in this, when it's all finished up. A number of these buildings are on the construction. So the homes are a variety of sizes, single family homes, and they're, um, I don't think, I think some of the multifamily projects have been started, but I don't think any of them are complete yet. But the residences are all built out and have, they did an auction for them um, because they, were, they knew there would be a finite amount of people who, I mean, of buildings and lots of people wanted them, so they auctioned them and they went very quickly. So the stormwater, this is the stormwater management plan here. This is um, a big, huge lake and some walking trails around it. And that collects all the stormwater from the streets and from the rooftops that don't. Many of the rooftops have rainwater collection, but some of them that don't, that <coughs> stormwater goes into this lake system. And it's cleaned up by a variety of different plants. And elevation drops. So the water has to move through this whole system. So 15,000 native trees are being planted. And they, it was interesting, they relocated. There were, the entry to the old airport was lined in trees, and they didn't just mow those down, they relocated them and they dug them up and moved them for a while and then they, they placed them on parts of the property. Um, so a lot of these are very mature trees <coughs> that are going in. I know people that go over there, Liam Armstrong goes over there to ride the bike trails throughout the system. Um, this is part of the water reclamation system. So this is a huge system that's going, this is not built yet, but it's going to um, get all of this wastewater, filter it a little bit, and then send it out for use before it goes to, they're hoping that none of that has to go to the um, wastewater system. <coughs> so one of the innovations is this very large heating and cooling plant. Um, heating, cooling, and power, and that's already up and providing all of the power for this community. Um, and it provides, it's not going to provide um, 
the heating and cooling from the residences, but it's providing the heating and cooling for the commercial properties. And we also have a think tank about energy that's being developed out here. So we're trying to, to think up ways of having more um, energy conservation as a city to try to develop economic development. So there are all these different entities that are involved in this, this think tank and brainstorming um, situation to come up with energy efficiency technology. So this is about how, why it's more efficient to have central heating and cooling plants. We already know the efficiencies are creating um, pollution reduction um, because it's tied with of energy source that we have and what the energy pollution um, reduction is. Okay, these are all relating to the energy. <laughs> We've already had Rick oh, Rodriguez can Oh his picture. His it I know. It is. He was much younger then. Um, he's been out a couple of different times um, to, because I know that he came out during the planning of Dow um, Children's Hospital and he came out for the um, platinum ceremony because how come they this platinum ceremony and then um, when we, they were planning um, the lead um, uh, pilot project. Okay, so this is summation, transit orientation, increased density, retail and employment centers, walkable streets, 25% housing that's affordable, 20% open space, extensive stormwater management system, hiking bike trails, native landscaping, trees, reclaimed trees, reclaimed water, um, central heating and cooling, and all the buildings are rated. So that, that was happening. In the meantime, 
you may have been alluding to. They also are changing the concept of lead AP. Do you want to know about that too? Or no? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I was afraid you were going to ask that. Um, so it used to be that you would take one exam and you would be a lead AP and there was um, a separate exam for lead for commercial interiors and yet another exam for lead for existing buildings. One of the things that all of the systems have in common is some of the guiding principles of green building. So they decided, what if we have one exam that was just about guiding principles of green building and some of these core concepts that are in every single rating system. And we'll call that the green associate exam. So that you will have a familiarity with green building and the lead rating system, but you won't have an intimate knowledge of them so that it would be you would need to study more to be able to be a practitioner. So they created a different exam for practitioners. So then they'll then have a specialty exam. So for lead for new construction, that will be one specialty exam. For lead for neighborhood develop neighborhood design, that'll be another specialty exam. So there'll be lead for Operation and maintenance will be another specialty exam. So there'll be all of these specialties. The leave for homes will be a specialty exam. Everyone's going to be required to first take that green associate exam, one exam, and then take a second exam for your specialty. And then you can have more than one specialty. What happens if I have already released the EPA in construction? Okay, so if you have a lead AP in new construction, first of all, you don't have to worry. You will be grandfathered in. At the moment, they are hoping that people will upgrade to these specialties, but they haven't required it. Um, they're not saying that they're gonna, like at one point they were threatening to take your lead AP away unless you, you did this, but they, they're not going to do that yet. I mean, they haven't made up their mind what is going to constitute a lead fellow, but you would be eligible to be called a lead fellow. That's what I'm counting on. I could be a lead fellow. Um, so that particular part, what a lead fellow is and what you do with your existing lead AP, they haven't exactly defined. Yeah. So if you're a lead AP for, for say, 2.2, and, and you're still a lead AP, you're still a lead AP, and you don't have to make any changes. <laughs> but you have to, I mean, you have to use for enrolling in the credential and maintenance program. Yeah, they want you to do this, yeah, maintenance program, right? Go ahead. Yeah, but you have to, I mean, like, right now you're a lead AP, you stay as a lead AP for the rest of your life, but if you want to upgrade to the lead AP for new construction and design or whatever you want to know the system, you have two years so you can enroll in the credential in maintenance program, which basically means you have to take some courses or some credits and you're something. Continuing <laughs> education is what they're considering this. Okay. So they would like you to, well, uh, you know, it's. They're modeling it along the AIA continuing education, which you have to take a certain number of continuing education units per year to maintain your AIA status. It's just like that. You can take courses that provide, like with AIA, all those courses cost money for AIA as well, but some cost more than others. They say if you attend the conference, the annual conference that you will automatically fulfill your um, your credits for that. But um, yeah, so there there is this credentialing component coming up. But you don't um, have to take an exam. Not, not yet. yet. I'm, I'm gonna say not to have to, right? Hmm? Like if you take longer than two years to enroll in the credentialing thing, you have to retake the exam so you can be in get AP plus. There's controversy about that. I've been reading a lot of 
a lot of blogs about it. But not since I quit being faculty. With faculty, you had to take every exam, every single one that came along. So no, this year I haven't needed to take any exams. But but so no, I mean at the moment it's I my personal opinion is it's being debated so hotly about this credentialing program that I think they're going to give a little bit on it. That's my theory. This is the UBC I went to. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So. So on the green, it's now the credentialing arm of Green Building Council is called GBCI. They have their own website, gbci.org. That's the good website to go to to understand what the requirements are now for becoming a lead AP. They have a handbook, finally, as of a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Green Building Certification It's too late for me to think anymore. Yeah. So um, they have some good information on that website now about how this is all supposed to work. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any other similar organization trying to develop some sort of uh, the same grading system that, that you probably are as a grading building council? Yes. Uh, there are a number all over the world. Um, Europe has about three different systems. Um, and ISO is trying to start kind of a, a system. You know, in the, as a standard, you know, a, a, a standard. Now that won't be a third party rating, but it'll be a guideline, I think. Um, I'm, there's, um, well, in England there's BREAM, B R E E A M, and that's one I like a lot. And they started an organization in Canada that then changed from Brim Canada into Green... I can't remember. So Canada has one. Um, yeah, a, num a number of countries have one. Yeah. The United States has this one from Canada competing with it, but it's, it's really not a third party Review. So, have you been in contact with each other to develop some like a plan? Oh no, no, no. In fact, the, that Canadian outfit was trying to sue USGBC. So in that way, they have been in contact in court. Um, but I, in my mind, um, there's the ISO, and um, there's another international. Um, standards organization that's working on um, green building international standards. It's different than the ISO. And they're, they're a number of different agencies are working um, to try to come up with something standard. But, you know, I feel it's really important to not do an international standard. This is my personal opinion. So this is not, you know, just take this with a grain of salt, but I feel that it's sort of like language. There are certain things that can't, that aren't universal, that can't be communicated in every single language. And I feel environmental responsibility is a similar thing. You know what's important to your community, and you know what's important to your ecosystem, and it's not the same thing that's important in Australia. It's not the same thing that's important in Seattle. So um, you're suggesting that instead of we I study the, the lead program as Mexicans, we should probably take a, our own plan, our, our own rating system for our community. For Mexico, yeah. There's a local rating system for the Secretaría del Medio Ambiente. 
But I know I'm a minority in that. With Konabi too. Mm -hmm. And Konabi is a local rating system. We try to make something in Konabi to, to <coughs> try to put something on the Mexican way. But it's different. Try to make here in Mexico, like the United States, the United States, they try to, everybody put something to go to the same place. <coughs> here in Mexico, we go to a lot of places different. <laughs> so it's so difficult to try to, to put in only one system. But we are trying. I understand. We have, a, we have a green building council in Mexico. The point of need is that everybody is supposed to be supporting the system yeah. and providing feedback to the system. So that's how they develop it. Voluntarily. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Voluntarily. So the problem that we have in Mexico is that we haven't been able to, you know, be a retro soft so we can work together and make lead a local system instead of being a national system. Uh, the Mexican Green Building Council oh, um, tried to make, to make a lead for Mexico and they decided that it was best to have the, the international guidelines and for those, although locally you would have to adapt them. So they, I mean the, council, the Mexican Council did decide it. The USGBC uh, decided that they would not allow the need to be anything but the USG and GBC need. So, for example, India has their own need. But after that experience, the USGBC decided that that need should be an international uh, trademark, so to speak. So, if you want to read a next project, they go through the USGBC. Okay? So, uh, I talked to Susan, who said that you you do have your, he said, of course, you could do your own rating system. But I think that what you're saying is it couldn't be called LEED. Exactly. It could definitely be um, based on these same concepts yeah. and tailored, but then maintained and um, reviewed and supported within the country. They're not saying of funny because I know the USGBC regarding how to apply it for the development in Mexico and they come we don't have anything international now. However, we are open to suggestions. So how is that supposed to work? Neither we. I guess I should say one more thing. Both Green Building Council and GBCI are entities that have grown faster than the history of any other nonprofit agency based on volunteer support. And it's been a very difficult thing to um, manage. Um, I think that you can very often get conflicting information depending on who you call. But um, being here, I really would. Um, rely on the Mexico Green Building Council to help you get the answers. So, any more questions? Thank you all very much. I'd like to thank Sue Barnett with a small recognition of our esteem and no uh, thanks. Uh, it's a small diploma for her very inspiring achievements. Um, for tomorrow, we have a workshop. I mean, the students on the enrollment in the diploma course have a workshop <coughs> with Sue. It'll be at the uh, same place we had our workshop yesterday with Jorge Canawati. Okay, so that's at six o'clock sharp as well, and. Uh, we are going to go through uh, the project uh, by uh, Eugenesis and, and uh, Pato Guerrero. And you, I think you've seen the project already, but we're going to go through it, uh, analyzing it uh, through this week uh, in the neighborhood development, okay? Um, so, well, that's it, folks. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>